Welcome everyone to the 71st episode of Kiwi Talks. I am speaking to a well-known actor within New Zealand, Jed Brophy, or some call him Master Jedi Brophy, which, which I like. <laughs> <laughs> How you doing? I'm really good, thank you. Just, just to clarify that, my nickname was, my mother used to call me Jedi which is J-E-D-I. So oh, really? I've kind of, yeah. So from the time I was about four or five, it's been her um, pet name for me. So I'm not trying to take over Lucas films or anything like that. It's just I predate Luke Skywalker. Well, that, that makes it even more applicable that you end up in Star Wars at some point. You need to be in Star Wars. Yeah, wouldn't it be great? Yeah, yeah. Don't you know Taika yeah. Waititi? He's doing a Star Wars film. <laughs> Yeah, I know. I I try really hard not to use my relationships with people to try and get work. That's good. Um, That's actually good because I'd be tempted if yeah. it was me. So yeah. you're a better person than I am. Well done. <laughs> you, you know, I, I'm not a, I'm not above throwing out the old hint. Yeah. But um, it usually backfires and he employs someone else. <laughs> well, the good thing is I can do it for you. So I can kind of subtly chuck it in, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Because it makes yeah, sense. You, Jed, add an eye on the end. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I'm waiting. What's that? You're waiting. <laughs> I'm waiting. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how does that? How does it? How does that work? Because uh, do you have an agent in the states? I, I have a. I had a manager in the states for a while, and in fact, um, I heard about a job and got a job on the Shannara Chronicles through that, um, and and it really helped me because I knew the rates that they were offering the American actors, so I was able to negotiate really hard through my agent. Uh, but I live here. If I want to go and work in the States, if I wanted to go and live and work in the States, I would, I would chase that really hard and get an agent there. But it doesn't really, doesn't really help us getting work here, not, not for the companies coming here. They're, they're, they go through our own agencies, luckily. Oh, right. Is that how it works? Because I always thought, because yeah. I think when you get big enough, right, because I'd imagine with LA being the, you know, the, the, basically the, the epicenter of Hollywood and obviously where all the films are being made, you kind of have to be there. But once you get to a certain level, you could kind of be like Carl Urban and live here and still get work there through word of mouth. I think you have to go and live there for a while and be seen by the agents and the producers for them to get to know you. Yeah. And um, I have to be really honest about this. Nothing against the people who live in Los Angeles, but that place leaves me cold. I don't, get a I don't get a feeling of it being a place that I would ever want to live you know I live on the Kapiti coast I grew up in Taihepi on a sheep farm this is who I am and this is where I want to be and this is we've been very lucky actually because of Peter Jackson and because of Rob Tappert and because of other people starting their own studios here they all want to come and shoot here we've kind of we're in a situation now best situation we've ever been in in terms of people wanting to come and not just use our locations but use our amazing crew. Our crew are talked about as being the very, very best on the planet in terms of problem solving and in terms of the cutting edge post-production facilities mm. that we have and that we're doing. And so for those of us that have managed to stay here and get work on um, Australian or English or um, American productions here, we kind of in a, we're in the best possible place we can be. We live in paradise. We eat organic food. We have a prime minister who genuinely, you know, cares about the safety of every single person, you know, in terms of the way that we dealt with COVID. I think we're blessed to live here. And I may have left it too late to go and live it in Hollywood. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, you, what, what is it that they say the grass is always greener on the other side, but not necessarily. Yeah. I, I find every time I go overseas, I appreciate New Zealand more. Yeah. And I'm sure that would be the same yeah. for you. Yeah, I lived in London for a while. I took a, um, a theatre show in 1998 to the Edinburgh Festival and we won a Fringe first and we got a season in London. And so I did some auditions for the West End and even got a part just before Lord of the Rings was greenlit and I flew back home. And I did seriously consider living there, but it's, I'm a small town boy. Mm. Those big cities, they do something to my mental state. I get quite frazzled. And I think I found Los Angeles like that too. If I lived out of... Los Angeles State, maybe if I lived up, you know, upper California or maybe even lived in Vancouver because I lived in Vancouver Island when I was a 14-year-old um, for a brief time. I could do that. But I need to be able to go and see my horse. Mm. I need to be able to see my friends, go in the sea and just have that kind of New Zealand sensibility where people tell you, pull your head in. 
that doesn't happen in Los Angeles. No, They're telling I, you to grow. Yeah, I bet it doesn't. I did. I, I think I remember reading somewhere, I heard somewhere that, that you were considering moving to Vancouver. Yeah, I mean, I would. I, that's because I've lived there on Vancouver Island. It's one of the few places in the world, apart from New Zealand, I would consider living. And I've got friends who have started their own studio there. Unfortunately, they kind of got it up and running just before COVID happened. Mm. So the back end of this, when we all are allowed to travel again, hopefully one day, I'm still going to go and have a look for sure. Mm. So how did you become Peter Jackson's go-to guy? How, how did that happen? Because you've been in almost every single production of his. And in Lord of the Rings, you were, what, seven characters? Yeah, I, I think there's a bit of luck involved in how you get to meet people, where they are in the industry, and at what stage they're in the industry. I or, originally auditioned for Lionel and Braindead two years before they made it, and or a year before they made it. And the, the story is that a person from Senator Films, a producer, stole a million dollars to, to originally make Brain Dead, and they took off with it. And so they were left with a crew in Wellington and they made Meet the Feebles. He'd met Richard and Tanya and they'd just been doing this TV puppet show. And so Meet the Feebles happened. And when they came around to do Brain Dead again, when Senator came back with more money and said, we're really sorry that that person did that, they'd changed it from the 1990s to the 1950s. And I was doing a play uh, written by Stephen Sinclair, who's one of the co-writers of Brain Dead. And he said, oh, I've got a friend coming to see you tonight on stage. I've been talking about you because you'd be perfect for this part. And Peter came backstage and offered me the part of Void. And I initially, my initial response was, I don't really think I want to be a zombie until I read the script. And it was, I mean, left the script there and I read it. And it was so funny. It was just so hilarious. And I'd sort of forgotten about this audition I did for Lionel. I didn't really, hadn't done a film before, so... Um, so yeah, it was kind of a, that was kind of a bit of luck that I was in a play that, that the character is very similar in terms of his attitude to the world as Void was. And then working on that film, he really likes visceral actors. He likes actors that will do, try and do their own stunts, who are really physical and will try to kind of create a character so that he doesn't have to give you a performance. He expects people to come with a performance that he can tweak. And I think, you know, Tim Baum and I, we talk about growing up on that film and learning, learning how meticulous he is in terms of his shot selection and how much he rehearses and how important it is to concentrate, but also understand the, the inner world of your character. A lot of directors don't give you that. He gives you great backstories, but he expects you to go away and do your homework. Um, and I like someone who, who gives you the confidence to actually do that. Mm. And, and yeah, and, and then I auditioned for Heavenly Creatures and got the part in that. And then I guess because I'd done prosthetics on Brain Dead before, when it came to do those orc characters, they were looking for people that they could stick in the rubber and they could actually perform through it. And again, initially, I wanted to be Aragorn, you know, yeah, yeah. or Faramir. <laughs> as, as a young man growing up in Thai Happy, I was Aragorn riding around the hills in the sheep with the orcs. But you've got to sell a film and you've got to sell it with people with a profile and you've got to sell it in Hollywood. And so you know when i sort of understood that i embraced playing the nasties someone's got to play them <laughs> someone's yeah, yeah. got to be the bad guy yeah because how, how long so that's how long were you in the prosthetic work for like when you were getting it done uh, um the longest my makeup was for shaku was seven and a half hours oh my god seven and a half yeah. hours what do you do yeah I'll, you try not to go to sleep because, and I've told the story many times overseas. The one day that I went to sleep, they used to, I had nine layers of body paint and they used to have five artists, two working on my face and the rest painting my body with these nine layers, putting scars in and embedding the scars into the paint. Then they'd roll me over and do my bag. And the one day I went to sleep, they wrote, somebody who's never owned up to this. And if you're out there listening, please know that I will find you. <laughs> they wrote, I love Vigo on my butt cheeks. And they took photos and um, apparently he ended up with one. I don't know. And um, yeah, to this day, uh, there's a great quote. It's okay to love a man. You can even like him, but don't have his, uh, his name tattooed on your ass. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of the quote that came away from that particular incident. So if you can't fall asleep, then how do you keep yourself sane or not bored? I suppose when, when you're just sitting there with someone just on your face, doing what they need to do. You can sort of talk. I mean, there's, you have to be careful when they're doing 
you know, usually the prosthetics are done in pieces. So they'll put the chin piece on and the forehead piece, the cheek pieces. And then when they're doing around the mouth, you have to be silent. But I'm, I'm not bad at not having very much sleep. I'm pretty good with that. Um, I find it actually worse to go to sleep. I feel like I lose energy. And I love watching the makeup go on. It kind of helps me build that character. As the pieces go on and I can see how the character started to take shape, I formulate a plan for the day. So that's how I use that process. Oh. Um, I've, I've read, you know, Doug Jones, who does a lot of prosthetic work. He's probably the, the, the king of prosthetics in the States. He's, he's the same. He likes to see the process of the makeup going on and kind of go into that inner being in terms of being able to do that creature work. You have to be, you have to be able to go to a place where you're not thinking about being uncomfortable. Because if you start thinking that, that's your whole day. That's all you can think about is being itchy, being feeling tired, the lens is scratching your eyes, you know, the teeth hurting, not being able to talk properly, not being able to eat properly. If that's what you think about, you'd never do it. So it takes a it takes a person who can come compartmentalize the uncomfortableness to be able to perform. And I think that's why, you know, I hate being typecast. And I, you know, I've said many times I won't do prosthetics again. But there is a challenge involved in it. And I quite like challenges. Mm. Because also the thing is with those orcs that you played, you use different accents. Yeah. yeah. So how'd you come up with the different voices, I suppose, for them? You just, you just play around with it. Yeah. You know, the, the great thing with working with Peter is he's, he says, don't tell me, show me. So when you get on set, you have a crack at it and he'll go, yeah, no, no, I don't, I don't, I don't like, I don't think, I don't think he talked like that. <laughs> so you've got to try and, you know, you have to, you have to have an A game and a B game and you have to be willing to just throw it all out the window. And it doesn't matter what director you work with. That's the same thing. You come with an offer and if they're brave enough to, to follow you, they'll do that. But, but all directors also have in their head an overview of how they see it. And so you have to be willing to, be bold and be quite strong to hang on to your idea, but you also have to be willing to throw it out the window if it doesn't serve the project. Mm. Originally, and I don't know if this is true, but originally I was told that the orcs were meant to be Slavic, have a kind of a oh. Russian accent. So we were taking the orcs, these taking the hobbits to Isengard, you know, <laughs> and um, <laughs> the wizard, I hate the wizard. You can imagine how long the film would have been. Oh, it's yeah. already four and a half hours. But if you had this quite slow accent, it would have slowed it right down and maybe a little too comic. Th there is a good story here that there's a scene in Fanghorn Forest where I'm playing Schnager and I get my head cut off. And there's Ogluk, there's, you know, there's uh, Nat Lees and there's Robbie Magasiva and there's myself and Stephen Ewer are all on set. But we were in New Zealand when they were doing the ADR in London. They had two days to get the film finished before it showed at the premiere there. There wasn't going to be enough time to fly us. So we did our lines down the telephone to Andy Circus at Abbey Road and he mimicked our voices. And so every single character in that scene is revoiced by Andy Circus doing the accents that we made up on the day. What? Really? Yeah. Well, they just, there was just not time. There wasn't time to, to get us all out there in time before the film showed. That's how, that's how when, when you've got someone like Peter who shoots right up until the last day, that's the kind of pressure that you end up on, you know, to get the film released. So, was it, so that's the situation we're in. So was, it, was there much difference between the filming of Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit or was it largely the same in terms of how it was structured? Very different. We had, you know, we only had eight weeks of location on The Hobbit, whereas we had 14 months of location on Lord of the Rings. So there's a lot more ADR because where the studios were in Wellington is right next to the airport. So every time a plane went over, you can't use any of that dialogue. So I think probably 98% of Lord of the Rings had um, dialogue replacement done afterwards, which is a skill in itself. Um, and also, you know, when you're shooting exteriors and doing plate shots, it takes a lot more time to post-produce. It was shot on 35 mil. So, you know, you have to process screws and screws and screws of film to edit. Um, and although he did a lot of takes, he didn't do as many takes as he started doing once he was working digitally, because it doesn't matter how many takes you do, you can just go over it. Um, and yeah, largely we were in these big sound studios. Most of it was done on huge sets that this amazing crew of construction people managed to roll in and out every day. And a lot of green screen. A lot more green screen on The Hobbit than there was on Lord of the Rings. So if you've got a theatre background and you're used to imagining things that aren't there for yourself and the audience, it makes it uh, a much easier job if you can kind of dispend belief and imagine that there's a dragon there. 
and Martin won't mind me telling this story, but <laughs> there was a day when we're trying to look where the dragon is and Peter said, the dragon's there and then he's there. And Martin was like, so he moves quite quickly. And he went, no, 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 he's there. And he's also joined and he's also there. That's how big he is. And we were sort of looking at the dragon like it was moving very quickly, but we were trying to look a bit like the Starship Enterprise with everyone moving in the same direction, trying to get 13 or 14 actors to all look in the right place at the right time. You get crew walking around with big sticks with a ball on the end to be the eye line. And that becomes your day. It becomes a very, a very interesting day when you're just trying to make up stuff in your head so that the audience believe it's there. It must be easy though when you go to a premiere because you don't know what the effects are going to look like. And so like, let's say you see Smaug, you must be like, oh my God, like, because you have yeah. no idea what he's going to look like, right? Well, the, the great thing about both those projects was they were very smart. They got the two illustrators who are most famous for doing Tolkien's work, um, Alan Lee and John Howe, and they would come with these amazing sketches to give us a kind of an idea of what things look like in the scale. They also built these these amazing scale models, uh, at what we call the model room. So you could go in and have a look and see the scale of things. But then they built these incredible life-size sets like Edoras, um, you know, down the South Island doing Lord of the Rings. They built a wooden city for the Rohan to be in down there in, um, on top of that mountain, um, you know, down there in Clearwater. And then in the set and then in the studio, they built the same life-size set for you to work on. So... They do a lot of the work for you, but you're right. When it comes to creatures, you do have to have a vivid imagination. And then when you see it on screen, you go, how did they even do that? How did they know to have me swinging in that direction, knowing where the beast was going to be and for it to take the blows? And those special effects people, I know they get paid well, but man, they earn their money. They really do. Because it's, you know, I couldn't do what they do. To have that imagination, but also to make it move in the way that a creature should move that stuff takes you know that takes a lot of talent it takes a lot of time as well yeah for sure have you ever gone to Weta and just sat in while they're doing it watching what they're doing yeah i have yeah I, I, I was lucky enough to interview peter in the editing suite i think i might be the only actor that's ever done that i was definitely trying to get myself a job <laughs> yeah there was there's big posters of the damn buses i'm going you know you're going to remake that i'd be great as this character and that character but he talked about how his job is to edit the rhythm of the piece in terms of it's not always about performance but about the rhythm of the of the set piece in terms of the build and the resolution and the build and the resolution and what you're actually trying to tell in that story then that gets thrown to the special effects people once he's done uh, you know the edit of the of the rough draft then they have to piece those bits into you know that it's like putting a jigsaw together trying to get the right effect in there and how that effect then changes the edit and then it has to go back to him to re-edit it once the special effects have been done and then the post-production of the sound has to go on that every single footstep has to be foleyed every single sound effect has to be right and then mixed so that it doesn't overcome the dialogue or the um or spoil the effect for the audience so it's um that post-production is probably the most painstaking part of it anyone can make a film but not everyone can make a film palatable by getting the special effects right and, you know, we have the best in the world. Most, most um, big blockbuster features in the States have some input from Weta Digital, yeah. you know, um, to finish them off. Yeah, a lot of those big Marvel films at the moment are done by Weta. Yeah. Yeah, and we, we get to do a lot of motion capture for those films here. I, you know, I did some this year in Portsmouth Road for a couple of films, actually, because of COVID, um, where we go in and we try and seamlessly mimic a performance from an actor and then do some action or dialogue or whatever, and then they can kind of piece that in there. Because with motion capture, you can play anyone. You know, I can play seven foot, I can play two foot. I can play a very wide person or a very skinny person. And you can do up to four or five characters in a day. In fact, when we did um, the reshoots for Tintin, there was only me and Jamie Bell, Andy Serkis, and Nick Blake and Eddie Campbell doing all of the characters for the reshoots, with, with Steven Spielberg directing from LA on occasions and Peter directing here in Wellington. So was Steven Spielberg ever in New Zealand, though, at any point? No, he was directing via satellite. Really? That's, yeah. that's weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, but it's... You get used to it. Yeah. That's, the, that's the world that um, Peter and people like Richard Taylor and Jamie Selkirk and, and all of the other people that put the infrastructure together, you know, Philippa and Fran, they've made it so that we have that kind of facility that you can be anywhere on the planet and still beam stuff in and have it finished or, or worked on here in New Zealand. We are, 
we're the envy of the of the modern filmmaking world here because we have a sensibility that we're not too big for our boots, but we have some of the best craftspeople on the planet working here. We are very lucky. Yeah, we definitely are. I hope I hope as the years go by, New Zealand invests more in technology or innovative technology because it makes sense, really, considering yeah. what we're able to achieve. Imagine what we could do with um, more money invested into it. Yeah, it's it's been the. I mean, I think. The late Jim Anderton actually said that maybe 15 years ago that we should be investing in um, that kind of technology and that kind of invention, putting more money into that than into primary industry. And he's probably not wrong. The, the very lucky thing here is with having both Peter here and also James Cameron is that they are not in competition. They're trying to advance that kind of technological um, advancement together, and Spielberg as well. And they're all they're all you know they're all pretty tight with each other. And I think. I think that helps us here in New Zealand because a lot of that is actually being produced here or the ideas of it are being produced here. We just don't have the raw materials to make a lot of that stuff. Yeah. That, I mean, that, that, is, that is the biggest problem is the, the, the heavy metals and things you have to mine to, to make that technology available. It may not be sustainable. Mm. That's my own. I don't know that for sure. That's my fear. It's a good point, though. It's a good point. Did you yeah. do any work on Avatar 2? Or have you? Can you even talk about it? Probably not. Um, yeah, I did a little bit of motion capture on it. I can't talk about the project, course, obviously, yeah. but yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so you've met James Cameron? I have, yeah. yeah. I, I, I managed to meet him at, um, when we were doing The Hobbit, actually, and I got to talk to him about going down in the bathosphere. That oh. probably was the, yeah, was a, that was a, a cool thing to talk about. You know, he, he's, most of these people who work on these, you know, Spurberg and, and Peter as well, they are geniuses. They, you know, they are, they're, the way that their mind works is different to other people, I think, the way that they see the world. And I, and I think that we're in a kind of a, a place in the industry where they've managed to rise to the top and they're kind of pushing the envelope. And so we're very lucky to be able to be included in that. Yeah. There's one little cameo that you did, which I really love in District 9. It's a small yeah. little thing in your, docu in your documentary section. Because I think, it, yeah. would, that, would that have been a day's work? Well, you know, where you just say that line? They look like it, plant, it was. And like in, in fact, I, I did two or three hours of, of a quite a big monologue that Neil wrote for me. And that's the, that was pretty much the one throwaway line that they kept. And he explained it. He was very honest about that. He said they'd shot a lot of this um, uh, outside stuff, you know, on location in Johannesburg. And what he, what he wasn't sure of is whether the pictures told the story. And so the documentary stuff that he did was kind of linking and explaining. When they came to cut the film together, they realized they didn't need all of the stuff that we'd done, that they could actually go outside and show that rather than actually have us talking about it like talking heads. Mm. I was actually at a surf lifesaving competition in Gisborne when I got the call if I could be in Wellington at six o'clock the next morning. And I drove through the night oh my listening God. to the rugby channel listening to Victor Matfield on the rugby channel, talk about playing the All Blacks <laughs> and going for the eyeball, trying to get that kind of Rustenberg yeah. um, accent. <laughs> so, I mean, that happens a lot in this, in this industry where you sort of get caught up at the last minute and you have to try and, you know, race to, race to some location and get yourself sorted. Yeah, because how long is that drive? Is it, what, nine, ten hours? Yep. I literally didn't sleep. I arrived at five to the time I was supposed to be there. Got, and I was pretty tired. Yeah, I bet. But just, yeah, but I just, um, I'd heard about what he'd been doing and I'd sort of, you know, I'd been around at the time when they were going to do Halo and yeah, it was just a really interesting project. And I love, I love the dialogue that he wrote and it was just him and me and the DOP in the room. So it was just the three of us. And that's, that's always the best. You kind of feel like you're, like you're in the game when it's just the three of you and there's no one else getting in the way. Yeah, yeah. But it's like it's it's an iconic line because obviously you're talking about the prawns. So. Yeah, the prawns. Yeah, the prawns. They look like prawns. You can't say they don't. Yeah. They look like that, so we call them that. <laughs> yeah, it's it's and it's also that's also an ad libbed line, and that's as an actor, that's that's a win when your ad lib gets into a film. You go, okay, I obviously sort of know what I'm doing. Yeah. <laughs> did you did you do that much in in Lord of the Rings or uh, the Hobbit? Did you get to ad lib at all, or was Peter pretty <laughs> particular about the script? Because it's Philip and Fran writing the script, yeah. you, you kind of have to try and say the words. I, mean, you <laughs> yeah, know, yeah, Mar I think Martin Freeman, he's, um, he's pretty good at trying to get the old lad libs in there. And there is one, he got a yus, a Kiwi yus into the film. Um, oh, he's, he? he's talking about having stolen the Arkenstone, I think. And he goes, and Gandalf says, did you take the Arkenstone? He goes, 
Yes. He was determined to get a Kiwiism in the film. <laughs> but um, it was great watching him and Peter negotiate, trying to get him to be consistent, you know, because he likes to do every take differently. And um, there, was a, there was one day where Ian McKellen walked back to lunch with his arm around him going, please just do what he wants or we'll be here till 2025. <laughs> you know? I think we were 30 takes in. And that was the same for everyone. But the great thing is it's a pleasure to work on those sets and it's a pleasure to work with the man. And so you want to try and, in some ways, you want to try and stretch it out as much as you can because you're having such a good time. Yeah, well, it makes sense. I mean, I've, I've seen a lot of the behind the scenes stuff on both, both trilogies and like, it looks like there's a, a good camaraderie there between everyone there is yeah yeah i've you know i've said this quote before and it's probably not mine but i think they employ good people that just happen to be really good actors but it's because you're stuck together in that very close confinement and working in very hard long hours you know they're long days you want a group of people that are not, not going to pull they're not going to pull the i'm in my trailer stunt i'm in my trailer i can't be bothered they want people who are actually willing to get up and do the work and and get on with each other and they kind of embrace that. They have these, what we call soirees, where the, the cast and the crew get together and we have these parties to kind of not just relieve the stress, but also talk about what we've been doing and enthuse each other about other projects and, and kind of hang together and, and generally enjoy each other's company. It's important when you're working on something where you've got to try and it's much easier to be comrades and not have to manufacture that to, than to manufacture camaraderie when you all hate each other. And um, I think both those projects... I'm still friends with all of those people I worked with. And whenever I travel, I try and catch up with them. Um, even here in New Zealand, you know, Graham McTavish and I meet every couple of weeks for coffee and just talk about stuff that we're doing and, and hang out together. And I, I, I do readings for him for auditions and I'm, I'm his lucky charm. He's got a few of those jobs. That's a, that's a good segue um, actually, because I only found out recently that he lived here. I thought he still lived like over in the UK or something. Cause, and I kept seeing yeah. him in videos and stuff in New Zealand. I'm like, oh man, he comes here a lot. And then obviously you did yeah. your uh, the iFit stuff with him, which must have been yeah, really, great. really cool. Well, he'd just done it in Scotland um, with his trainer, Nikki, And uh, he actually suggested me because of my knowledge of, of this country, having you know ridden around most of it on horseback. One of my primary jobs on Lord of the Rings was one of the, one of the 20 full-time horse trainers. So... I got to see the entire country from horseback. And I, I know when I was at university, I, I, I tramped the Root Burn and the, and the Hollyford and, and the Reese River. And so I know a bit about the, the, the structure of what makes this country beautiful and was able to suggest to them some of the places they went, but also remind them of the importance of the land to the Tangata Whenua, to the people of Aotearoa, the, 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 the Māori people especially, and to pay reverence to those place names to try and get them right but also just how important it was that we understood where we were walking and what had happened there. Um, and so, you know, Graham put me forward for that. He actually got me that job. He, he talked me up. Oh, that's so and, cool. Um, uh, yeah. And I'm forever grateful because it was the coolest gig, man. We got, to, we got to go to some places that I'd not been to and to share that with people in another country. And I've always talked about that on The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings too. One of my, one of my biggest... Uh, takeaways was being able to show not just my friends from overseas but the rest of the world just how amazingly diverse and beautiful this country is and how we need to protect that i talked about that a lot you know with uh, with the ifit people from utah just about how we've got this clean green image but actually that's a kind of a diminishing thing yeah. we need to we need to be honest about that so we can do something about it and although we saw some beautiful places, I also pointed out the places that weren't so beautiful anymore. Yeah. I mean, I was in Queenstown a couple of weeks ago showing my partner around because she's from India. <clears throat> and I hadn't been to the South Island since I was a teenager. And uh, it was just crazy to me. Just every lake and river I saw was blue, like clear, clear blue. And like yeah. you, you come back to the North Island and, you know, you see polluted rivers and rivers that are green and... Uh, and it's, yeah. it's a reminder that, yeah, we need to make sure that we protect it. Yeah. It's, we talk about there being this loss in overseas tourism, but the infrastructure isn't there in a, in a lot of the places. When we went to um, tramp the, the Hooker Trail up to Aoraki Mount Cook, you know, that we were, there were queues of people on either side of those swing bridges and there were no rubbish bins. 
I watched people just dropping tissue paper and all sorts of things in front of me. And I ended up grabbing a bag and getting some of the crew to follow behind as I picked stuff up. And I talked about it on camera. They didn't use it, obviously, because that wasn't the purpose. But it made me really angry that there isn't education as to to why we shouldn't be. And it wasn't people from overseas necessarily doing that. It was Kiwis as well, dropping litter on a trail of this most amazing beauty. It, I don't understand it. It does my head in. I just don't understand why you would do that and not think, oh, I'm here enjoying the beauty. I'm going to mess it up. It just Maybe it's where I grew up in Tai Happy. I think that a lot of the people there do genuinely care about their environment and they, as a community, try very hard to look after that. Mm. And I think that there are small places all around New Zealand doing that. But as soon as you get that many people coming, you know, the, the millions of people that come to New Zealand all at once and the infrastructure's not there to begin with, then you're up against it. Then it's a clean-up. You're not ahead of the game. And I'm not saying that we should have big signs telling people, but there needs to be some sort of education. You know, if, if the Department of Conservation and, and um, Forest and Bird and the people administering those tracks could have people there educating those busloads of tourists coming about what's expected, when you come to this country and how we all need to be katiaki and, and look after it, then I think that's important. That, that's, you know, that's my takeaway from that IFIT thing is we could do more. Yeah. I sometimes wonder if we should be like Singapore and just find people that litter. Absolutely. Canada too. When I, when I was there, when I was 14, it was a, I think it was a $500 Canadian fine if you were caught littering and they, you know, and it's on the spot. You, you either pay it or you don't drive off. So, and, and, you know, that was, they were having people just chuck stuff out of cars there. It was kind of a, a thing that was happening there in 1978 when I was there. And my mum used to work for Keep New Zealand Beautiful. And it was one of their things is going to schools and educating kids about why you just carry it to the bin. And right here in Paikakariki, just down the road at the Surf Life Saving one day, in the car park, a group of young people just opened the door and shoved all of their McDonald's out. And they were literally five yards from a rubbish bin. I don't know where that kind of behavior comes from. Is it that they don't care or they're trying to make a statement or they just are so lazy? It <laughs> could be, know. it could be all three. That's what it, it could, could be. Yeah. It could be, but it's, you know, we can't expect people from overseas to adhere to what we see as being the rules of keeping something beautiful if we're not willing to do it ourselves. I think a lot of Kiwis take it for granted though. I know for sure that I did. It wasn't until I went overseas that I appreciated it more because you're born into it. So you don't know anything else. Um, I know when I went to India, I was like, Oh, okay. I fully understand now. Um, yeah. yeah, So it's definitely something we need to be, um, more appreciative of. I'm going to have some politicians on here at some point. So maybe I can subtly. Yeah. Hey, we need to do the film industry too. You know, we, one of the one of the most amazing things when we shot um, down at Edoras is that they took all they took a thousand plants that were endemic to only that place. They took them out and they kept them alive, and then they put them back at the end of filming. And we shot in places that the Department of Conservation and the local EB had never allowed anyone to shoot before, simply because there was a promise that we would leave it better than what we found it. And I'm very proud of the fact that. You know, probably, you know, 90, 90% of the time on Lord of the Rings and on The Hobbit, we managed to do that. We managed to protect the environment and pay reverence to the people who own the land and, and love the land that we would not actually destroy it as we were shooting. Mm. The film industry is fairly, it can be quite a toxic environment in terms of the stuff that you're using and the amount of stuff that gets chucked away. So we need to kind of look at that as well. And, you know, we'd need to be mindful of the fact that Although we're creating this great entertainment and education for people, there is a cost. Yeah. So do you have like a favorite place that you've visited within New Zealand? Where I grew up, there's a, there's a waterfall on the Hautepa River, which used to be our waterfall. And that's my two don't, you know, that's my, that's where my way to my spirit resides. When I go back there, the world disappears. I'm at peace. It was on my grandfather's property and the waterfall was parpa and it ran down into this beautiful deep pool on the Hautepa River, which only runs 23 k's. You can still drink from that river. It was full of eel and, and uh, full of brown trout. And that's the place. If, I, if there's a place in the world that I could choose to live, it would be going back there. Because mm. I know you're a fitness freak as well, or as Mark Hadlow has said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in terms of like your fitness regime, 
what do you do day to day, week to week in terms of staying I do fit? a lot of walking. Yeah, look, I do a lot of walking. I walk the dog as much as I can, and I go to the gym three or four times a week, especially if I've got a project coming up. But I've done that since I was 17, since I knew that I was going to go and be a phys ed teacher. That's just been part of my regime. And I taught aerobics for a long time back in the day. So, yeah, I, I keep fit. I keep fit not just for my job but for my mental health. It's, um, if you're not working, if you are at least doing something – active that kind of keeps you from worrying about that stuff so it's a double-edged sword you know um i've lost parts because i'm too fit what do you but mean i like being fit what do you mean you've well, lost you know, parts for being too fit you know people say oh, you, you're too fit you, you, we're looking for someone who's a you know middle-aged slob because oh, right. it's a fit well, can't you just a wear a fat industry. suit or something well, you can, but productions are not going to go to that expense if they can get some. But the great thing in this country, of, in terms of my age group, there's a lot of people who are really good who have cut their teeth, you know. Um, and that, that sort of keeps you, that keeps you from getting lazy too. When, you, when you've got competition out there, people who are equally as good as you and have done as much work as you. Got to work on The Luminaries, um, that TV show, and it was amazing to see how many people in my sort of generation are still out there doing it and are at the top of their game. Really, really good people. It was, it was a reminder, actually. I looked around and just went, oh, okay. There's a lot of good people in our industry. And they're all hungry for work still. So it makes you stay competitive. It makes you stay motivated and ambitious. Yeah, and you can't wait by the phone. You also have to make work for yourself. You have to go out there and chase it. And I don't mean going to parties and talking to producers. I mean finding projects that you want to do and finding writers that, um, that can write them and talking to directors about projects that you that you like. I'm, I'm working on a one-man show with a writer called Ken Duncan at the moment about Woody Guthrie. And so I've been learning the songs and learning about Woody's life. And it's a two-hour monologue. You know, it's one man on stage. And this is, we're, we're doing a reading on Saturday to see if there's any worth in it. You know, we've got a group of people coming in to sit there and tell us if they think this is a project that has the legs. And so that's something that Ken and I have been trying to do for 15 years. We've been talking about it. And um, finally, we're sort of we're in a place now where we can do it in this country because the rights have become public. Um, yeah. Ah, okay. You yeah. are so good at different accents. Have you done much voice acting? I have. Um, again, it's, again, it used to all happen down here at Marmalade Studios. It all moved up to Auckland. And, and I think, you know, location is everything. I haven't really pushed in the, in the last few years. I haven't gone chasing it. I've, I've been busy, but, my grandmother was from Scotland, and so she had a brogue. And I think if you grow up with an accent in your family, you start to manufacture it yourself because you hear it every day. You know, people talk like that. And, you know, like I do a good version of Billy Boyd. I'm like, yeah, I'm Billy Boyd. I'm like, I was a hobbit. I was really cute. I love it. But, you know, I'm a mimic. And so when I went to Scotland, I heard the different accents and different dialects, and I'd try it on and see if I could get away with it. I got into trouble a few times because – some Kiwi friends of mine were staying there too and they came in and then I started talking as a Kiwi and the Scottish people were like, well, you're winding us up. What's your problem here? You think that's funny? I'm like, well, no, I was just, I was just thinking I could get away with it. Uh, you know? But I, I imagine you could easily get voice work. I mean, particularly like say with like video games because it's more cinematic these days. So they have a lot of voice actors. Yeah, I have done some of that as well. You know, I've, I've done a few voices on, 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 on the occasional thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like what? What have you done? What have you done? Um, you remember the uh, John Alomu All Black game? Yeah. Did motion capture on that and did some of the commentating. And the whole t I did two of the characters in Te Papa for the Te Papa exhibition yeah. for um, World War One, And I also narrated the whole thing. But, you know, those kind of character voices are, are, are crusty New Zealanders or New Zealanders from the time. I did play So and Too Good's 87 year old father in a radio play. Oh, I had to be this kind of crack it out, Southland farmer, took a lot of this in there. So I did a lot of radio back in the day when we did radio drama. And that, that's really good for actually getting your accent work and also jumping between characters. But yeah, oh, I don't know why I haven't chased it actually. I just, I need to put down a new reel for, for my, um, they keep chasing me to do that. And I'm just, it's not laziness. I just, haven't really thought about it. <laughs> there's a there's a guy on YouTube who basically I think he spends about ten minutes just mimicking all these different actors and stuff, and it's really really good. Yeah. But I reckon if you did yeah. something like that, it would easily go viral. Uh, you'd easily find work, and it, I suppose all you need is like a studio with a a mic, and you're sorted. Yeah, really. particularly these days with COVID. Yeah, my my biggest problem is I, I 
it's probably the same for most Kiwi actors. I don't really rate myself. It's it's a weird thing, eh, when you when you work all the time, but I don't I mean I do it for my friends and for those people around me. It's it's kind of weird for me to do that kind of thing. Although during lockdown I did do a play for um a monologue. We had to a writer spent twelve hours writing it and then I had twelve hours to learn it and film it for um Centre Point Theatre and I played an Irishman <clears throat> written by my friend David Geary from Vancouver and you know, people are saying I, so you were Irish? I'm like, no. And then on King Kong, you know, I played an Irishman on that. And, and for all the behind the scenes, the behind the scenes person thought that I was from Dublin because I told him I was. And I had to kind of, once I'd started, I had to stay in that accent the whole time we were filming. <laughs> and at the end, when he found out I was a Kiwi, he was not, he wasn't horrified, but he was a little bit angry. <laughs> well, that's a well, compliment in a way me. that. It is. When you can convince someone from their own homeland that you are from there, then you've yeah. You've got it, right? Because yeah. usually people but, can, like, I can pick out when, um, you know, an American is trying to use a, a, a Kiwi accent. Usually I can be like, eh, yeah. it's not quite right. But, yeah. yeah, so, like, oh, it's a testament to you then. You're too humble. Yeah. That's but, what it is. Too humble. But it's always, for me, it's always been just for the people around me. I'm, you know, I, I like to entertain. It's, um, it's, I, and, and I, know, I know someone said you should do stand-up, and I'm like, I'm terrified of doing stand-up. I have so much respect for those people. Because I would just, I just like doing it for a laugh. I'm not really doing it to try and make any money out of it. I, I know that sounds weird. It's just, it's my pastime. <laughs> well, you've got nothing to lose, I suppose, if you're doing it as like a, a pastime thing as opposed to an actual job because then the pressure's on because you have to make money and, you know, people are paying yeah. to see you. So yeah. they are. And that, that you know, I've, I've spent some time around stand up comedians and that pressure, they feel it the pressure to come up with new material all the time and, and to, and to be funny 24 seven. It's um, I think I'd find that a bit wearying. And, and again, I like to do lots of different things. Maybe one day, maybe one day I'll have a crack and just see if it's that terrifying and see what happens. Yeah. Give it a go. Why not? Life's, yeah. life's too short. As COVID has shown, life is, life is too short. It's, you're very true. Actually. It's been a, it's been an, it's been very bad for the rest of the world and it still is. But I think it's also had some positive effects. That very thing that you said is that it could all be gone tomorrow. And why wait? Why wait for that tomorrow? Get on and do it today. Yeah, I think it's. I think one of the things I've seen is, uh, I think society has become too complacent as a result, and COVID is kind of a way of Mother Nature in a way saying, "Hey, I'm still in charge." Yeah. 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 I think you're right. You know this. I've got, you know, two sons, 24 and 28, and this generation have it tough, man. They have it tough because we didn't, we didn't get on to cleaning it up. And now we're, at the, we're at, the, at the sharp end. There's no more complacency. There's no more waiting. There's no more time. You know, we've, we've got the planet to a, to a tipping point. All the great scientists keep talking about it. All the politicians keep putting it off till tomorrow. And it's time. And when you have them on, the, when you have them on your show, ask that question of when they're actually going to, get the dustpan and brush out of the cupboard and actually start doing it. Well, they'll it's probably give well me a talk. political answer, knowing them. <laughs> they will, and they're very good at oh, that. Oh, yeah, they are. That's they're why they're politicians. Yeah. That's yeah. why I probably but couldn't do it. <laughs> yeah, I know. But, yeah, it, it worries me. It worries me that my generation are leaving behind a legacy that's going to be impossible to fix. Yeah, well, I, I worry completely for the next generation. Obviously, you've got climate change, and then you've got the the gap between rich and poor is growing. I mean, housing in this country is getting up insane. It's it's getting way yeah. hand. Um, I mean, yeah. I, I've we we yeah we had that opportunity to you know to put this tax on people having property investments, and it saddens me that we didn't. And I know all of those property investors out there, if they're listening, they're going to hate me for it. But it's just if I have a small business, you know, and I do, um, you know, I sell photographs i've got a, i've got a calendar coming out of my photos and an artist who painted those photos we've got an exhibition happening this afternoon i have to pay tax on that that's that's a business i'm expected to pay tax on that as a as a you know gst person it's no different if you have an investment house why should that be exempt from exactly the same tax as anybody your business included has to pay yeah i i totally agree but uh, yeah. the problem is a lot of these politicians have investment properties and then yes. <laughs> also a lot of their base have investment properties and they don't want to lose votes. So 
Yeah. And so you've got, <laughs> you've got the two big parties that don't want to do anything. And then the minor parties yeah. that do want to do something, they don't get enough clout or media attention to really make any difference. So you're kind of just stuck in this you are. hard place. If they, all, if they all had to live in a moldy flat that had no insulation and they've got $5 a week of a disposable income at the end of paying their rent and their fees, it might be different. And I know some of them might have done that in their early days, but it was different times then. In my flat in Dunedin, the entire flat that was seven bedrooms cost seventy-five dollars for the entire flat. I mean, you wouldn't even get a you wouldn't even get a toilet for that these days. Yeah, yeah four hundred, you know, two hundred and fifty, three hundred, four hundred dollars for a room in Wellington. It's just nuts. And when you're lining up to go and have a look at a flat, and there's one hundred and forty-five people there, and then someone comes in with a wad of cash and just says, "Well, I want it," they go to the top of the line. You can see why young people are just going, well, the future isn't that bright in terms of me being able to have a place just to live in, just to have a place where actually rest my head. Yeah, because I'm originally from Auckland and I moved out of Auckland and bought a house in Hamilton, um, primarily because I couldn't afford to live in Auckland. I was just like, this is ridiculous. Like, I'm never going to be able to afford a house here. Um, And it's gotten worse in the time that I've lived. And I know Wellington is getting really bad as well. Yeah. It's like almost on par with Auckland. It's... It's, it's insane. Yeah. It's got past that. It's got it's got to the point where students are all moving home because they don't have a choice. You know, the fees that the fees are high. The jobs that they're able to get while they're studying don't really pay the rent. So there is a shortfall there, and they're kind of getting further and further in debt. And we wonder why there's so much anxiety in that community. It's because they simply don't see that there's a way out. Yeah, you, you know, you have you have to address the big stuff that they're dealing with. It's a, it's a trickle down effect in terms of how it affects the psyche, and we're seeing it more and more. GPs and people working in mental health are seeing it, you know, every day. And I also think, you know, talking about our industry, we need to also make sure that we're telling those stories too. You know, we do a lot of entertainment, but there's also we have not just a responsibility, but I think there's some there's some stories there that we could tell in our industry where we actually ask those questions in a dramatic way to get people to think about it. I mean, at least that's my hope. Maybe those people that we're talking about, the people who can do something about it, maybe they wouldn't watch that program. Maybe they'd, maybe they'd ignore it. But I do think, you know, as storytellers, these are the stories that are happening right now. I was part of a group of um, people doing a project called Roxy Five where Jamie Selkirk, who built the, um, f- the fabulous Roxy Cinema in Wellington um, in Miramar, he... I uh, ran a competition for colleges and whoever won that competition for short films got to have their short film remade with professional mentors. And when it came to the writing, we said to them, don't, don't try and tell American stories. Don't try and tell car chases. Tell the stories about what's happening to you and your fellows right now. And the film um, by this wonderful filmmaker called Awa was, was called Black Dog and it was about depression. And it was not just moving, but it was really, really insightful in terms of someone from that generation talking about what was happening to her and her friends. Mm. Um, it, was a, it was an amazing piece of storytelling because it was so honest and so moving. And it wasn't about trying to be cool. It was just about telling the truth. And I think, you know, my hope is that there'll be more of those films. Um, I'm an ambassador for the mobile filmmaking community worldwide. I was on a judging panel with Steven Soderbergh and um, Mr. Parker, who made Tangerine last year. And, you know, on this, on this thing here, we shot a feature film in 30 hours um, last, uh, two years ago in Mochuaca, and, and that film went worldwide. This is in your pocket. If you have a lens that you can put on this and a gimbal, you can go out and make a feature film. Yeah. You can make a short film. You can tell stories. And so... I hadn't realized that before. I wasn't part of that community, but now I am having realized that Soderbergh has made three feature films on a phone, one with Claire Foy. Um, Some very popular people want to work that way. We don't necessarily have to be part of the big studio. We can actually just get out there and tell those stories. And there is a platform. There are platforms that we can show it on, you know, not just YouTube, not just Vimeo, but actual mobile streaming platforms made specifically for phones. I see that for young people as being, a game changer because everyone has a phone. It's not like you're having to go and buy that equipment. Yeah, well, that's right. The lenses are, the lenses are two or $300 to turn it into widescreen 4K. You know, that's what it costs you to set it up. You just get out there and have a crack. Yeah, because you seem pretty up with technology. You seem pretty up with the plug. You kind of have to be. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, 
working on that project with Steph, with Steph Harris, the director, and with, and with Mark Hadlow, we hadn't used that technology before, but, having, but seeing how easy it is, the apps like Filmic Pro Max an app that, that color grades as you're shooting, it, you can shoot from 24 up to 60 frames per second with that app there. And if you have an app that takes it off your phone onto a laptop or onto a hard drive, your phone doesn't fill up. That stuff is all there, and those people are very generous. They've been very generous with their time in terms of explaining that to me and other people how it works. And there's lots of, um, you know, streamed uh, documentaries that show people how to use that equipment. But young people know it. They already know it. I talk about it and they go, yeah, 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 we know. I'm like, okay. <laughs> well, they're like learning apps yeah. and everything, you know, five-year-olds like learning how to do coding. It's, it's insane. I know. It is. It is insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. I just I see that as being a way of them getting into the industry, learning how to 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 make those stories. We're the only country in the OECD that doesn't have a mobile film festival. The one that Mark and I went to in Sydney last year, it's in its sixth year this year. The one in San Diego has been going for fifteen. Um, the one in the Netherlands where we won the Supreme Award has been going for ten. Oh, wow. And so we're sort of behind the game. Oh well, we need to make it happen then. We do. How do we make we it do. happen? Well, so we need we need someone we need someone like Ant Timpson or someone like the late Bill Goldston who can actually get the get the city councils on board. You need someone who can walk that walk. I'm okay at talking to those people, but I need someone who has that kind of kudos. Peter here Jackson in could. And, he could. He has a lot of yeah clout. He does. He does. It's just getting to. It's just getting a sit down. <laughs> yeah, I imagine he's really to... busy. I mean, people have asked me like, "Who's the number one guy you'd want to have on the show?" And I'm like, Peter Jackson, but I know he doesn't do interviews much, and he must be insanely busy, and he's intensely private. So, um, yeah. yeah, yeah, it's yeah. I mean, you know, I know him well enough that I could probably get five minutes, but I wouldn't want to bug him unless I had the infrastructure in place. Like, he'd be a good person to actually put a stamp on it. But I'd like to see that it was actually the people who can make a difference who aren't just him. You can't always go to him all the time. There's there's a lot of people in the filmmaking community in Wellington that also, they also need to step up. Mm. You know, the, we, we've, and I'm not bagging the Film Commission, but they don't have anyone there that understands making making films on phones. Is, is it because they're all old heads? It's just because of the fact that it's a, it's a government funded bureaucracy. They have to have targets that they go for oh, and they have right. to have a charter and a structure that they head towards. And unfortunately it's not part of their charter as yet. Um, I hope that it will be. I hope that there's a branch of it that looks at how to get young people into films. Cause if you're trying to raise a hundred thousand dollars to make a 16 minute film, how do you justify that? Yeah. We made a feature film in 30 hours on a phone for $12,000. And that won awards all overseas. It won, it won feature film awards at proper festivals. But trying to get them to understand that has been, it's been really difficult. I'm going to be honest about that. Yeah. It's been a, like a closed door. But I wonder like, if you had a young person within the film commission that could help explain this to someone. So I had a, so I had a business guy, Rob Campbell, uh, on my show yep. a while back. He's like chairman of Sky City and stuff. And, um, he had someone that pitched them, uh, pitched to him esports, like in terms, and he was like, "I don't get it." He he didn't understand it at first. You're like, "Why would you? Why would you watch video games? Why you know it's an interactive medium?" And this guy had explained yeah. to him like, "Well, you watch sports, right? Like you go and watch sports." Yeah. And so he had to use that analogy, and he's like, "Ah, oh, okay." And I know when I was speaking to him, he's like, "Look, I still don't quite get it, but I understand how it can be utilized." So maybe it's just a simple yeah. matter of some young guy who um, has a lot of swag, has a good with yeah. gift of the gab and can probably just speak yeah. to these guys and maybe give them another perspective. Yeah, I, I agree with you. And there are good people there. You know, I've got some friends that I have talked to about this. It's just the way that they're set up. It's all, it's looking for the next Taika Waititi or the next Peter yeah. Jackson or the next Nikki Kara or whoever. And it's kind of, the idea is to be able to go to these sales places with a bunch of New Zealand films and to be able to sell those. And, and they just haven't caught up with the fact that, you know, we went to Cannes. We sold our film at Cannes this year. But, but there was another film there from India who was, you know, in competition as well. And, and so it, this, is, this is not just the future, it's the now. It's not looking to say we're trying to take away from shooting on the red cameras or on 
Super 35 or, you know, we're not trying to take Christopher Nolan's job. This is a way for young people to get their stories out there. And worldwide, there is a huge platform for them to get it on. So you're right. It, it does come down to that. But I think you sort of, it's a chicken and the egg thing. We could keep going and banging on the film commission store till we're blue in the face. It's better just to do what we did and get out there and do it and then be able to say to them, hey, did you realize we just won another award? Did you realize we're at Cannes this year? Did you realize that we sold it? Did yeah, you know well, that's, we that's probably the best way. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think you've always yeah. got two different types of people. You've got people that kind of cling to the old way of doing things. And then you've yep. got, kind of got people that kind of just are very ambitious, uh, very forward thinking, and they're chasing the new thing. I mean, Peter Jackson was was pretty much that. A he was that guy. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. What, what's his quote is, don't wait by the phone. The phone ain't going to ring. <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, that's right. You, you got to get you got to get out there and, and just do it. You know, like his, like you know him making bad taste all those years ago. You know, he had so many things happen that could have put him off, but he just kept going because uh, he's not just a visionary, but that was his passion. I, th I think young people. I think they'll get onto it. You know, I've been banging on at this every time I go to a school and when I go and talk at the writer studios from Miranda Harcourt and various things. I always say to students, "This is." You know, you can go and shoot on this. You know, I've shot a series of photos on it that have, we've made this, you know, made this uh, this calendar from. And I just did that with a Moondog anamorphic lens, which is used for filming, but it turns it into beautiful widescreen. And the definition is off the planet. There's no reason not to go and do that. The, the equipment's out there and it's cheap. Um, a friend of mine who works in uh, Canada, she's making her first feature film on a phone with that technology as well. Um, uh, she was in uh, Once Upon a Time, Mrs. Keegalicious, as we call her, and she's making a feature film because she was in lockdown and had nothing else to do. And, and she sees that as being a way of her doing her first feature without all the pressures of a studio telling her who she's got to cast, you know, where she's got to shoot and how much money she's got to raise for it. And it's the same with Soderbergh. You know, you know I saw his interview about doing Unsane. and he said, I waited seven years. I waited for seven years in studios and talking to people. And then I just went, oh, I've got three weeks. I've managed to get Claire Foy. I've got a crew of seven. Let's just shoot it. You know, if you've got one location like that and you can lock it down and light it well, you can actually shoot very, very, very simply. I think sometimes the studios are just so focused on money and there's all the politics that they lose sight yep. of that. They get in the way. Mm. They all want to be creative. Let the creatives do the job, man. Your job is to find the money and then sell it. Mm. Don't get in the way of an auteur. Um, I may be speaking out of turn here, and I'll, you know, probably if those people ever find me, I'll get slammed. But I think that Warner Brothers kind of got in the way of, of Peter and the Hobbit. I think they got in the way of him being able to do what he does well. Yeah, well, I mean, it's, it's pretty evident during the behind-the-scenes stuff that uh, there was a lot of fiddling in there. I mean, obviously, Peter Jackson yeah. would probably be the only one who could say 100%. But, um, yep. you know, there, there's, yeah. a, there's a big contrast between Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit, and that even in terms of pre production, right? Because, yeah, Peter Jackson had so much time to plan, and like with The Hobbit, yeah. he didn't. And I think, um, there's some behind the scenes footage which shows that basically you're laying the tracks directly in front of the train, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, w it was a, it was a, there was a feeling of unease too, because I've, I've known Peter for 27, probably near 30 years, and I can see that he wasn't the affable, funny, kind of relaxed person that he usually is. You can feel that pressure when someone, you know, if you jump in bed with the devil and they give you $600 million, there's, you're answerable. You're answerable to their whims. And Warner Brothers love or hate them. They're into franchises. They're into building a series of films that follow on from each other to generate income and to generate merchandising. And, you know, that merchandising is an ongoing thing. And they've got various people whose job that is to do, but none of them, none of them are auteurs. None of them are filmmakers. None of them are people that can actually look at a script and in their head imagine how you can actually get the best drama out of that. And if you get in the way of that process, you're actually stopping someone from actually getting a flow on. And that's what I think happened. That's what I could see happening is that there was not that same flow. You know, Peter would see stuff on Lord of the Rings and get, get this amazing idea about how he could shoot the next scene from stuff that was already happening on set. But if you've got people dictating 
what your day is going to be, then that stops it. I mean, I might be making that up. I'm only talking about what I personally know from the difference between those two projects, the freedom that we had on Lord of the Rings and the tightness of, of what it was like on the Hobbit. Mm. Well, he looked tired. That's the other thing as well. Yeah. He looked really tired on the Hobbit and it rightly so. Yeah. I mean, and I mean, there's, there's so many stories about it, but like, it just, it seems like it was just plagued with issues constantly yeah. from like the get go. And even with the Hobbit lore yeah. and all that, just even beforehand, you know, so it yeah. wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't a streamlined process. I mean, that's not to say that Lord of the Rings would have been easy either, but <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we made stuff up. I, I tell the story doing those big gallops and twizer with 300 horses. And we had a guy called John Scott, who was John Wayne's riding double back in the day. And he's, he does all the big horse films in the States and worked on Unforgiven, the big Westerns. We were setting up and he went, Oh my God how have you not killed people? <laughs> it was just that, he just said, you can't do this. And we're like, well, we didn't know. We're just making it up, mate. We didn't have a horse department before this particular film. We didn't, we didn't know how we were supposed to train horses for films. There isn't a handbook. We didn't grow up making Westerns in this country. We didn't grow up making, you know, countless, countless films with lots and lots of horses or people riding with stampeding cattle. So of course we made it up and yeah, of course we made mistakes, but, I'm still very proud of the work that we managed to put on screen. I mean, some of that horse work is just phenomenal. Dangerous. I'll say that openly. There were days when we got lucky. Yeah. But we, we you know, that, that great Kiwi way of sorting out problems couldn't have been done in any other country. The way that we just jumped to it as a bunch of people. And Kiwis are amazing like that. And, and American production companies, especially British too, just go, wow, you guys are incredible. You all do three or four jobs. You don't just do the one thing that you specialize in. But also Kiwi crew are willing to help each other. They'll jump in and carry lights for each other. They'll jump in and, and grab a horse if it's out of control or whatever. And so we literally couldn't have done that scene. We couldn't have done those shots in any other country other than here. Yeah. It's amazing to me what Lord of the Rings became, right? There's this before yeah. after with it. I mean, no one could have ever predicted how, how much impact it would have had on the world and in terms of how it put New Zealand on the map. I mean, I know when I've gone to America and people ask me about my accent, in some mall or something and i'll be like oh i'm from new yeah. zealand they'll be like oh right lord of the rings yeah hey, do you know peter jackson know. i'm like well i know of him i don't know him personally yeah <laughs> yeah but like, yeah. it's just you know new zealand is synonymous with lord of the rings now yeah, yeah. I, I think the third biggest theater in this country is film tourism in terms of people coming here to look at the locations and you know the ifit people came here because they're all fans that's the reason they wanted to come oh, and look really? at those locations. Yeah. And yeah, and a lot of the locations we chose were locations where we did actually film. So we could talk about scenes that we shot there and what it meant to be there and, and how beautiful it was, but also <clears throat> how we used that landscape to create, um, you know, a character on its own. Like I think New Zealand is, a, is the greatest single character in those films is the landscape. We couldn't have done it without it. It's breathtaking. Those aerial shots that, um, that Barry Osborne was in charge of, the executive producer, yeah. he did all that aerial photography. Those linking shots, it doesn't matter how long they go on for, you watch them. You don't get bored because it's just so exquisitely beautiful. And the thing is, those shots don't even do the landscape justice. I mean, I was down I there, I took photos, I had my drone, I took all this footage. And like, I remember looking at it, I'm like, man, this just, is, just doesn't do it justice. Just... I There's know. no camera it's that can the... show this. Um, no. we, did a, we did a flight over the Milford Sound, I think, uh, two weeks, three weeks ago when we were down there. And, like, we were in a plane and I was just flying. I was like, man, this is just br so breathtaking that even if I yeah. send pictures, they're just it, – it just doesn't do it justice. You know, it, it really looked like a scene out of Lord of the Rings when flying over. But it's just amazing. Yeah. yeah. It is. Yeah. We, we came – I took a, uh, coming from town now back to Queenstown and my driver had left. So I jumped in the car with Martin Freeman and um, Nikki, Nikki was our driver. And we came around the corner and said, stop the car, stop the car. I'm sick of the beauty. This is not real. Weta has to stop doing this. I need to see a city. I need dirt. I need noise. <laughs> you know, he was just like, it was that thing of going, it, was, it wasn't that he was bored. He was just like, is there anything disgusting down here? Yeah. Is there something you can, I mean, that's kind of crowded and London-like. But it's so true, though. I mean, it's it's just ridiculous. Like, 
I mean, because we hired a car, we were just driving around. I mean, we went to Mount Kirk, Queenstown, Milford Sound, Dunedin, just driving anywhere. And it's just the, the scenery constantly changes and it's always beautiful. I mean, even that drive yeah. from Queenstown to Glen Orkey is like, I know. It's just, I know. It's ridiculous. Just insane. Yeah. It's, I've shot a lot of stuff down there before Lord of the Rings and after. I did a, a series of um, ads for Polish vodka, which is just five guys galloping through those rivers down there in Paradise and Glenorchy. And then, of course, shot a lot of Lord of the Rings down there. But then I went back with the horse that I now own, which was one of the Rohan horses. He's one of the last, actually. He's 24 now. He was three when we started. And went down and did a series of ads for Nintendo, where I was racing a four-wheel drive through that forest there in Paradise. And um, it is, you can see why people come. Because you go from one amazing kind of bit of beauty to something that looks like it's a completely different country. And it's yeah. only seconds away. Yeah. You're in that beach forest and then there's wide open plains and those amazing rivers. And then the next thing you're in this kind of pine forest. And so partly that's why they had to shoot here. And partly that's why I think the TV series came here is the diversity within an hour. You don't get anywhere else in the world. No, you don't. You really don't. You just don't. I mean, there's places obviously like um, places in Scotland and even Canada where obviously there's some ridiculous, yeah. uh, ridiculously beautiful landscapes as well, but it's so far apart. It is. It is. It's Whereas vast. Here, this, yeah, where the scenery yeah. changes constantly. So, yeah, it, it makes it, I suppose, easily accessible. I'm yeah, sure if you're shooting... More accessible, I should say. Yeah, we, we had three units working full-time, four if you count the miniatures. So we had a splinter unit, and then there was second and first unit, and sometimes there'd be 400... You know, 400 miles apart but peter was always in touch via monitor what was happening um sometimes we'd have to chuck a horse a special horse for someone on a horse float and just drive to get it there to be able to shoot for an hour at the end of the day because they needed it and so it made it it was difficult enough in this country let alone if you're having to drive for nine or ten hours between locations you know yeah yeah for sure yeah. well hey i'm gonna wrap up there yeah. This has been amazing. I could talk to you forever, but um, I won't. <laughs> yeah, it's been, it's been said that I can do that. <laughs> <laughs> I think a lot of people could do that. I could do that myself, but I have to monitor time. But um, thank you so much for yeah. doing this. Uh, You're very welcome. It was fun. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if anyone wants to follow you on social media, where can they follow you? Jedi Brophy. Um, on, so J-E-D-I-B-R-O-P-H-Y on Instagram. Um, at Brophy Jed on Twitter. And I have an official Facebook page. Um, it's not administered by me, but it's, um, I do post stuff on there, just Jed Brophy on Facebook. So, yeah, those are my three sites. Cool. And that, that'll, that'll keep you, um, well, you update that all the time, I suppose, with all, all the stuff do. you're doing? Yeah, I do. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. All right, everyone, that's the show. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe and support Jed. And, uh, yeah, stay safe. 